And join me as we open our midweek service this week with a familiar hymn, There is Power in the Blood. Here we go. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? Power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. seated for sure. Good evening. Maybe. Maybe not a good evening. I don't know. Somebody, somebody give me a good evening. There we go. It's not, it can't be too bad. It's like one of the most beautiful days outside. We should be doing service outside, I think. Uh, but uh, good to have all of you here. Welcome for those of you that are visiting with us because of uh, who is speaking tonight. Welcome to Quinton Road Baptist Church. I would encourage all of you uh, that are in the room, if you are visiting, uh, grab a blue box on your way out. Um, they are at any of the exits and uh, has some information about our church. And uh, also there's a QR code on the front that if you'll scan that, it'll give you a, a free gift card to uh, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, um, Dunkin' Donuts, I think. So uh, you can grab one of those and uh, learn about our church, but uh, if you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to, to visit and uh, see what Quinton Road is all about. Tomorrow starts family camp up at Whitewater, Wisconsin, so keep that in your prayers. And a uh, great time of fellowship, uh, really digging into the Word, and so we're excited about that. Also, new this year, you can watch if you are not able to go. Uh, you can watch all of the services on the live stream uh, at, face, at our Facebook page or at the uh, QuintonRoad.org uh, page as well. And so that, those will start at 7.30, so keep that in mind. And uh, also uh, on, that, on the Quinton Road page, if you go there, the address is there for Whitewater, Wisconsin, uh, Camp Joy. And uh, all of you are welcome to come up and drop in. Uh, no charge on... Uh, Sunday at 11 o'clock, that'll be our service up there, and that service will be live streamed here. So if you're planning on coming here, uh, that's what you'll see, so you might as well just come up and join us uh, at, at uh, Camp Joy in Whitewater, Wisconsin. Uh, due to that, there are some schedule changes uh, as a part of uh, Sunday, so there's no nursery, there's no kids or adult groups, and there's no evening service this coming Sunday, so keep that in mind as uh, we'll just be live streaming uh, this service from uh, Camp Joy. Also, adult groups and uh, Foundations 101 will relaunch August uh, 20th, so keep that in mind. You can go to the hub uh, at quintonroad.info 
and uh, there's a, a, a information on the different classes that you can get there, uh, or in the lobby at any of the Connect uh, tables, there's a pamphlet that you can get that has all the classes and uh, what they're studying uh, on there as well. Love to have you for that. Uh, we've had a great uh, summer uh, of classes and and things uh, with the adult groups, and so it's been a, a great uh, summer for that, but we'll be uh, splitting up into our smaller groups August 20th, so keep that in mind. Also, there is a choir open house, so even if you can't sing, Pastor Dave wants you to come and be a part of the open house. He'll teach you to sing, I think is what he said. Um, so he asked if I would not come to the open house, um, but... Uh, but that'll be uh, a choir practice uh, following the mor morning service, August 27th. So keep that in mind. And we are already gearing up for September 10th, which is our uh, QR Epic Kids Challenge. And so we're excited about that. Um, and I saw Tina out yesterday passing things out to police officers and firemen. And so uh, we're gearing up for that. And so you can register uh, for that event. Uh, at quintonroad.org uh, again. And this is a, a great opportunity to invite folks out. Um, people want to come and have a good time with their families, and, and so this will be a great time for you to be able to do that. And that is September 10th. So keep that in mind. Be in prayer for that. A few re uh, prayer requests before we take up the offering. Be in prayer for Jane uh, Scherenhausen's brother. He had a heart attack. He's in the hospital, and uh, she's praying for his recovery, obviously, but then also uh, for assurance of his uh, salvation. And then uh, Leo, uh, Diana's mom, is uh, in uh, bad accident, so keep her in your prayers as well. And then... Just a few updates. Uh, keep uh, John Kaiser in your prayers. He's uh, continuing to improve, uh, but we certainly want to pray for him. And then uh, also Jeff Herman and Ron Fontana also both suffering uh, with cancer, and so keep them in your prayers. And then Doc Horning had his uh, knee replacement surgery, and he's doing good from what I understand. Some swelling, but he's doing okay. He's doing uh, PT, and so uh, be in prayer for him. And then uh, Shara Ringel also uh, has been referred to another doctor, and so just uh, be in prayer for her situation as she continues to, to try to uh, find some relief. And then also, uh, new um, Jeff Romans just was talking to me about his dad. Pray for him. Uh, he's not in, in good shape, and so uh, we just ask that you would uh, pray for his healing. And so we'll do that tonight as we take up the offering, and then uh, after the offertory, I'll introduce... Uh, the speaker this evening. Father, we thank you for the time that we have to gather uh, this evening and to learn about you and to, uh, Lord, think about uh, some things that uh, maybe we don't often think about. And Lord, just uh, to uh, learn how we can deal with so many of the issues that we deal with in our world today. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, our service this evening. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, all of those that will be traveling this week for uh, family camp. Lord, keep everybody safe and all the different activities that will be happening up there, Lord. We ask that you give us safety and, and good weather, Lord. We also ask that you'd be with these that we uh, mentioned uh, tonight in our prayer list, Lord, that you would uh, continue to work in their lives. And uh, Lord, those that are looking for healing, Lord, that uh, if it would be your will, Lord, that you'd uh, raise them up. And Lord, especially for those that are uh, unsure of their salvation or, or folks that are looking for assurance of a loved one's salvation, Lord, we ask that you would... Um, Give us um, assurance of that, and Lord, what a, what a burden that is. And so, Lord, we place these things in your hands. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with the offering tonight as we uh, take it, and uh, Lord, that you would use it in a mighty way. Lord, we pray all of these things in your precious Son's name. Amen.
appreciate that. I'm excited for our speaker this evening. Uh, many of you that are uh, a part of Quinton Road Baptist Church and in grace uh, will recognize him. Um, and uh, he was on our uh, Exploring God's Oceans uh, in Grace, and so he, he did a great job. Uh, but uh, Dr. Carter is, um, has his uh, Bachelor of Science of Applied Biology from Georgia Institute of Technology, and also has his PhD in coral reef uh, oncology from the University of Miami, which I'm, ex I'm really interested in, uh, especially pulling things off of the reef such as fish. So that's what, that's what gets me. Um, but uh, he also has uh, studied genetics in fluorescent proteins in corals and sea anemones and holds a patent in particular uh, fluorescent uh, protein gene. And uh, we were down in the Keys one year and we saw these blue little lights on top of the water that would all of a sudden turn green or vice versa, one or the other. Um, and they were everywhere, and I believe that's what that was, and uh, uh, what an awesome experience. But he's, he's a, a genius when it comes to, to those uh, protein genes. His uh, current research involves uh, new genetic patterns in human genome and development of biblical model of human genetic history, and uh, he works at the Creation Ministry International. He's got a lot of his uh, books and materials out there from that organization. Um, you can go to creation.com and you will find, oh my goodness, hundreds of papers that uh, Dr. Carter has written on all kinds of different topics. And uh, so I, I know you'll be blessed this evening and so give him a big Quinton Road welcome as he comes tonight. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out to hear a nerd talk about the gospel. Uh, my name is Robert Carter. Um, I am a, a scientist, but the most important part of my life is that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, I know that most people don't come to church to see a bunch of charts or hear a bunch of fancy statistics, so I'm going to keep that at a minimum. But I'm going to include a couple of things like that because I know specifically there's probably people listening right now or watching that are really fighting with their faith over some scientific issue. It is a very easy thing to get online today and find someone challenging you in a way that you can't answer. And most of those challenges happen to be scientific-like challenges. So some of this is going to be addressing some of those challenges. Now, uh, Creation Ministries International, the parent organization that I work for, we are 45 years old, I think. Uh, basically, I'm a second-generation CMI scientist. I came to this in the 1990s. I can't believe I get to work for this organization. Um, well, I remember running into Creation Magazine after hearing a uh, Creation speaker from this organization in 1989 or something like that. And I remember getting Creation Magazine and coming back to my dorm room at Georgia Tech, and I was barely a Christian. I believed in evolution, because everyone I knew believed in evolution, and my faith was crumbling rapidly. And I had this creation magazine, and there was something on, in that issue that I had learned the day before in my evolutionary biology class that they answered. I said, that has an answer? And then there was an article in there about something in geology I'd always wondered about. I was like, I didn't know the Bible could answer that. And I think this is a tool that God used to study me to Christianity. Just laying it out there for you. There's some powerful information there. And on our website, creation.com, uh, we have... I don't know, 10 or 12,000 articles on our website, and every week we're putting up new ones. We are an information ministry. We exist to answer your questions, and this is what we do. This is what I do all the time. I'm writing articles. I'm answering emails, trying to think of ways to explain things and answering questions that we haven't answered yet. Um, if you would like to plug into the type of information we produce, can I int um, introduce you to our email newsletter? Every Friday, we'll put out something new or informative or exciting. Very often, it'll be some big scientific you know, story. This proves evolution or something like that. And we'll have one of our people write an article within a day or two. And on that Friday, we have an answer for it right there. So if you like a Johnny on the spot, um, really up-to-date material, it's there for you. If you'd like to get it, it's really easy. As I'm speaking, we're going to hand around a sign-up form. We ask for a name, an email address, and a zip code. That's it. And we're not going to market to anybody else. And these two guys are going to be handing them out. Thank you, gentlemen. 
and I'm going to keep on talking. But the topic for tonight is biblical answers to questions about race and racism. And honestly, we all know these questions are tearing our society apart. There is so much strife when the question of skin color enters the discussion. We need an answer for this. But you know what? I'm not going to talk about Black Lives Matter. I'm not going to talk about critical race theory. I don't need to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give a biblical answer to the questions, and everything else can be then placed in that context. Just follow and, and watch how we do this. First of all, we're going to start off at the beginning of the Bible with God creating Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You've heard that before, right? You do know that that means that there's no common ancestry between man and any other species. Therefore, any evolutionary statement that deals with human behavior is necessarily wrong. Soon after that, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the place instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her unto the man. So how many people did humanity start with? No. One. Eve is a descendant of Adam. This is very important spiritually. Because that means that Eve is under Adam's umbrella. He is the federal head, the representative head of all of humanity. And when he fell... All other humans, including us, fell because we are their descendants also. Just like Jesus is our federal representative head. When he rose from the dead, that blessing that he put on to all of humanity can be applied to us also. Adam is our representative and Adam's Eve representative also, which means that sin did not come through the woman. Sin came through the man. Adam is the one who disobeyed God. God never told Eve not to eat the fruit from that tree. Eve wasn't created yet. So the blame goes on Adam. All right, just theology here. There's a lot of theology wrapped up in the creation account. But now we're going to shift gears a little bit and go into genetics. Genetics on a Wednesday night at church. You ready? Now, I am a practicing marine biologist. I spent years scuba diving in Florida and Bahamas and Belize. It was a tough life, I'll tell you what. And I'm studying these beautiful animals, these corals. And I'm trying to figure out what these colors are for. And I, I, honestly, I never figured out what the colors are for. But after doing a lot of chemical extractions of corals by taking an animal and grinding it up and running through a bunch of analyses, I realized the colors are based on proteins, which is weird because I'm made of proteins and I don't glow under black light. But corals and sea anemones and jellyfish do. They have what are called fluorescent proteins. Well, once I realized it's a protein, I knew there's a gene behind it. And so we wrote an application to our office of, uh, patent office at the university to say, hey, um, we know how to get these proteins out very quickly, and we want patents. And so I actually got my doctorate in genetic engineering. When I stole the genes from these, cor these proteins in these animals, and I engineered them into these animals. Now, that opens up a giant can of worms. Is genetic engineering moral? Good question. What are we allowed to do and not do in God's created order? At one point, do we break the line and do something that's immoral? Those are excellent questions. Go to creation.com, type in genetic engineering. I've got several articles on there, CRISPR technologies and things like that on creation.com. I just want to tell you that I love genetics and DNA. And as soon as I was done with my graduate work, the first thing I did is I went to the Human Genome Project and I hit download. I've got the Thousand Genomes Project on a spare drive actually out there in my backpack. I've got the Simon's Genome Diversity Project on a spare drive at home. I, for fun and partly for a living, I now write computer programs to analyze data on the human genome because I'm that kind of a nerd. But there's some things that I've learned I want to share with you that are super encouraging. I've written several papers. Uh, this one is on, have you ever heard of mitochondrial Eve, the one woman who's the ancestor of all people? Well, the evolutionists had never determined what mitochondrial Eve's sequence was, so we did, and we published it in Nucleic Acids Research. It was an evolutionary journal. That was a fun paper. Later on, I published a paper on the H1N1 influenza virus, 
And we showed how fast mutations accumulate in that virus all the way back to 1917. And we're the ones who figured out that it went extinct in 2009. Evolutionists didn't see it because they expected it to keep on evolving. No, we said this thing is devolving. It's picking up too many mutations. It's going to go extinct. And we're looking at databases and they stopped sequencing it in 2009 because it literally went extinct because natural selection is not able to remove mutations. Therefore, all species are doomed to extinction, which totally contradicts evolutionary theory. Hmm. Okay, shift gears again. Um, how many people are alive today? Do you know what that number is? We just hit a big milestone this year. Eight billion. Yeah, 7.1, that's what I would have said too. It's eight billion, we just hit that number. That's a lot of people. How do we get eight billion people if we started from Adam and Eve a little more than 6,000 years ago. Worse, if there was a Noah's flood, the whole world population was reduced to eight people. And Noah and his wife don't count, because the Bible says from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from these three, the whole earth was populated, essentially. I just messed that up. But Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and their three wives are the ancestors of eight billion people. And that was only 4,500 years ago. Can you do that? Can you get 8 billion people in the biblical model? Well, I went to the um, uscensus.gov, and they have these handy data, and I graphed the data. This is their estimate of the world population over time, from 10,000 BC until today. Now, biblically, the earth is not that old, but I'm just using the evolutionary assumptions just to plot this chart. Notice how flat, there's like a million people for a long time, and then all of a sudden, someone invents farming, in a few thousand years BC, the human population starts exponentially increasing until you get 8 billion people. That's the old earth evolutionary model. The thing is, um, that first part of the curve is a mirage. There's hardly any evidence for any of those people. If there's a million people on the earth and the average lifespan maybe is 30 years, um, that's a million new bodies every 30 years. Over 10,000 years, that's billions, if not trillions, of bodies that do not exist in the archaeological record. Because we haven't been around that long. But you know, if you start off 2,500 BC with six people, and you double that population every 150 years, which is a ridiculously slow population growth. I mean, I have four kids, I doubled my population in one generation. Human populations grow really fast. We'd say, no, only double every 150 years, you will get six, seven, or eight billion people. In fact, it, this is, I did this in like 2000, so 20 years later, it's probably more than eight billion people on my chart. The number of people in the world is not a challenge. But how much genetic diversity is there amongst us? I'm looking in this room, I see people of Asian descent, I see people of African descent, I see people of European descent, there's probably people in here with Native American ancestry. How do we explain that much genetic diversity? Why do we all look different if we came from Adam and Eve? That's a great question, right? Well, sadly, um, scientists who are believers, theologians, people like that are making my life very difficult. They have given, a lot of them have given up and just accepted the evolutionary numbers as is. This is uh, Dr. Francis Collins. If you looked around the world for a famous Christian in the world of science, you're not going to find an evangelical Christian who has achieved more than Dr. Collins. He ran the Human Genome Project. He just retired as the director of the National Institutes of Health. He's a very important person who's a Bible believer. But he wrote this book called The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. And this is a quote from Christianity Today from a couple of years ago. They write that he reported scientific indications that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors perhaps 100,000 years ago, long before the Genesis time frame, and originally with a population number something like 10,000, not two individuals. This is a scientist presenting his evidence of faith in what? Faith in the Bible? Faith in biblical history? That is straight up out of Africa population genetics there. They, they tell us, the evolutionists, that we evolved from a small population in Africa 100, 200,000 years ago that numbered something like 10,000 individuals. That is evolutionary theory. So you know that all that is with friends like that? 
I'm struggling here because the most important, most visible Christians in the world tend not to believe the biblical story, but I do. Well, one of his colleagues, uh, oh, before that, at a talk at um, a Christian scholars conference, he writes, talking about the diversity we see in people, there's no way you can develop this level of variation between us for one or two ancestors. So he's saying, you cannot explain black people and white people and orient, sorry, black is not even the right phrase, there's nothing called white. Um, you cannot explain African, European, Asian genetics if you just start with Adam and Eve. There's too much diversity. His, his colleague, Dr. Dennis Venema, speaking on NPR, he said, in order to explain what we see, you would have to postulate there's been this absolutely astronomical mutation rate that has produced all of these new variants in an incredibly short period of time. Those types of mutation rates are just not possible. It would mutate us all out of existence. Well, that's a big challenge, isn't it? These are people claiming to be Bible believers, and I'm not doubting that, but they're laying a giant challenge because they're saying the Bible's not true. The biblical story, you just read it like that, you can't just read it at face value. It must mean something else. There's no Adam and Eve. There's no Noah's flood. Well, I'll take that challenge. What my colleagues and I did is we went to the Thousand Genomes Project, and we downloaded chromosome 22, the smallest of all the human chromosomes. It's only 60 million letters long. But 60 million times over 1,000 people, that's a lot of data to analyze. And what I did is I pulled out all the variation, and I charted um, how frequent these are. So does this variant, this letter, this A at that location, everyone else in the world has a G, but one person has an A, so the frequency is one divided by a thousand. Oh, but 50 people have a G at this spot, and everyone else has a T. So it's 50 divided by a thousand people. And I did this chart. This is the, the distribution of the variants in, in us. This looks evolutionary. Most of the mutations we see are very rare. They're only in a few people. Therefore, they're new. If you have an evolutionary population over millions of years, you're going to get millions and millions and millions of mutations, and they all start off in only one person. If they start off in one person, by definition, they're on that side of the chart. And so we have this giant uh, population genetics program. It's called Mendel's Accountant. We've used it for many things. It's actually an evolutionary modeling program. It's actually the most sophisticated evolutionary modeling program to date, and it was written by creationists because we wanted to test evolutionary theory using their own numbers. Well, we applied an evolutionary model to this 10,000 people, 100,000 years. That's the blue line. And wow, um, it almost looks like an evolution the evolutionary model almost perfectly fits chromosome 22. So should we give up? No way. Let's now use biblical models. Let's take, um, let's use an evolutionary biblical model where we have evolution happening and then God picks two random people, kills everybody else off, calls these people Adam and Eve. They're an evolved Adam and Eve. Let's use another model where we just have a biblical Adam and Eve with no variation in amongst them at all. And let's use another model where God's not limited in his creativity. He could have put in a different genome in every single one of Adam and Eve's reproductive cells. So the amount of genetic diversity we see might depend upon how many children they had. That's cool. But every one of the alternative models that we used were a better fit to the chromosome 22 data than the evolutionary model. So not only can we explain the number of people, we can explain the genes amongst us just using 6,000 years with no evolution. Oh. All right, shifting gears again. Let's talk about races a little bit. That's what I'm supposed to be talking about. These are um, two really good friends. They're both Australians. They met in the Vietnam War, and they became best friends, or best mates, as they would say. The man on the left is Bill Kubera. He is an Australian Aboriginal. The man on the right is George Snow Wilson. I love that nickname, Snow. <laughs> He's a little bit white, you might say. Well, these guys are best friends in the war. Well, later on in life, Bill develops kidney disease, and he's looking for a kidney donor, and he can't find one. 
So George volunteers to be tested. <laughs> Come on, George. You can't, you as a European cannot donate a kidney to an Australian Aboriginal. Your populations, they say, have been separated for 40,000 years. Why on earth would you think you're a genetic match? You have to match like a hundred different factors. Well, guess what? Bill Kubera lived the rest of his life with one of George Kidney's because they were a match. Whoa, 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 whoa. How can these two people genetically match? Well, the answer is they haven't been separated for 40,000 years. They really did come from Noah's family, and that was only a few hundred generations ago. If you think about it, the average human generation time is about 30 years, about. Because females can have children from about the age of 15 to about the age of 45. That doesn't happen as much in the extremes, but the average of that is 30, and that's, it works out that way. In our family trees, it's about 30 years per generation. Well, if you take 4,500 years since Noah's flood, divide by 30, it's only 150 generations in all of human history. That's why these two people could be a genetic match. All right, now let's talk about another question. If we've got to put all this diversity into Adam and Eve, and we can allow room for some mutations, because honestly and truly, I got two red-haired sisters, <clears throat> they're mutants. Um, Red hair only appears in people of Scotch and Irish descent. It is a recent thing that happened. Anything that's on Noah's Ark is going to be distributed amongst everyone in the world, essentially. But the more localized a variant is, the more likely it's a new variant. So sickle cell anemia in Africa, it wasn't on Noah's Ark. Hereditary blindness was not on Noah's Ark. Blue eyes was not on Noah's Ark. Therefore, that is not Eve. This beautiful woman produces almost no eumelanin. That's a brownish pigment. She produces plenty of pheomelanin, though. That's a reddish pigment. But also, this is not Adam. That extremely handsome young man produces as much eumelanin as a human body can produce. Adam and Eve, though, could have created, could have carried all those variants in them very easily. I'm going to show you a map now. This is, I'm uncomfortable with this because this was collected by anthropologists prior to World War II, and almost all of them are European, and the European anthropologists prior to World War II, or almost all to a person, to a man even, because hardly any women in the field yet, racists. And they thought the Europeans were the top of the evolutionary ladder and everyone else in the world was beneath them. That's just the way it was. But what they did is they went around the world with a card, with a color scale, and they looked at the skin uh, on the side of a person underneath their arm. Why? Because that doesn't get sun. That is your skin color. My face is not my skin color. It varies. In the wintertime, I don't have much tan. In the summertime, I get a little darker. But this skin color doesn't change much. And they go around the world, and they do a map. And now we have a map of all the skin colors. But now we can apply modern genetics to this. And we learn a couple of things, very interesting things. First of all, the dark skin tones that appear in Africa, southern India, Australia, and Melanesia are caused by the exact same genetic variants. In other words, they're in the population before we spread out. Evolution did not produce them. Notice also that people in South America don't tend to have really dark skin. So it's not like natural selection in Central Africa caused people to have dark skin. It's not true. Same with the people in Indonesia. Most people have, you know, mid middle-toned skins. But also, have you ever seen the movie The Gods Might Be Crazy? The Gods Must Be Crazy? It's about the Khoisan people in Namibia, in southernmost Africa. They don't have really dark skin. They're Africans, but they have the skin color of a Mauritanian or an Egyptian or Morocco. They're fairly light-skinned Africans. Well, we now know, I love that phrase, you know what, when a scientist says we now know, you know what that means? It means we were wrong yesterday. But scientists never like to say that they were wrong, because the smartest people in the room don't like being wrong. And so we now know that the people in southernmost Africa with the lighter skin tones have the exact same genetic variants as the people in northern Africa with those skin tones. The skin colors are in the population before we spread out. There's also something um, that happened recently in Africa called the Bantu expansion. 
You've heard of the Zulu Wars in South Africa? Well, that was caused by the Dutch people finding a hundred mile wide swath of grassland that nobody lived in, and they thought it was free, so they moved in. But on the other side were the Zulus. The Zulus were Bantu speaking people that had killed off everyone with a hundred miles of their homeland. And the Dutch walked into a bloodbath, and then the British inherited that. And South Africa still has problems because of these things. But the Bantus, even at the time of Christ, were not occupying Southern Africa. They lived in Central Africa. Over the last 1,500 years or so, they moved eastward and southward, and they displaced the people that originally lived there. We find some bones in old caves, like ancient bones, and we take the DNA in Central Africa and we realize they're the same DNA as the Southern Africans today, but they don't live there now because they got killed off. But that's not just Africa. It happened in Europe, happened in Asia, happened all over Native America. Uh, the history of humanity is barbarous. And I don't care what skin color you have. The reason you're here is because your ancestors won. That's the way it worked. My point is this. We don't need evolution to explain the skin tones. We don't need millions of years. We don't even need natural selection. We just need people spreading out, and each little group spreading out from Noah's flood, from the Tower of Babel, has a different set of the genetic components. So in the end, we've been saying for decades that Adam and Eve probably would have been middle-toned. They would have brown skin, brown hair, and brown eyes. And the genetics is telling us it's probably true. That's just interesting. Now, where do races come from? Races. I hate that phrase. It's not, there's not really a definition of that word anymore. But where do the typical races come from? Well, they come from inbreeding. The reason people look characteristically like they belong to a certain area is because their ancestors never intermarried with people from other areas. And we have a great example of this in the Bible. This is a family tree of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're there at the bottom. At the top is Terah, the father of Abraham, and his half-sister, Sarah. They have a child named Isaac. And if a half-brother and a half-sister get married and have a child, it's as if they give birth to their own brother. Isaac then marries his first cousin once removed and first cousin twice removed, times two, because she's related to both of his parents, Rebecca. Their son Jacob marries his first cousin Rachel and first cousin Leah, who are much closer than first cousins at this point. And then you have Joseph and Benjamin, Reuben, uh, Simeon, Levi, Dan, all, all the 12 tribes of Israel. You know how you inherited 50% of your DNA from each of your parents, right? You know that? Got half from mom and half from dad? Well, that means you got 25% from each one of your four grandparents, and 12 and a half from your great grandparents, and then six, and about three. By the time you get from Terah to the 12 tribes of Israel, if you take the longest route, they should have had maybe 3% of Terah's DNA. But because they inherited Terah's DNA in multiple different lines, they have 22% of Terah's DNA. And, because of the laws of genetics, a lot of those sections, all 12 brothers would have exactly the same sequence of letters from both mother and father. So if there was a gene that affected their height or their weight or their eye color or the shape of the nose or the curliness of the hair, all 12 brothers could share two identical copies of that gene. So you could literally, walking down the street of some ancient city, be like, oh, there's an Israelite, and pick him out of a crowd because of this level of inbreeding. But this is just the biblical example. Genetically, we know this is happening all over the world. Most people in history have married someone who was grown less than five miles away from their, where they grew up. Charles Darwin married his cousin, and all of her brothers and all of her sisters also all married first cousins. Ugh. But it's incredibly common, and inbreeding means a lack of genetic diversity. And inbreeding leads to distinctive characteristics building up in a small population very quickly. That's where the races came from. And if you have a flood population, eight people, they start having children, the children are marrying each other, and then you have the Tower of Babel where God separates the people into small groups and sends them across the world that subdivides the population to, into small, isolated, inbreeding peoples. You don't need millions of years. Here's a map of the mitochondrial Eve idea. They say we, you know, we started in Africa a couple hundred thousand years ago. And it's something really interesting. They say um, 
a small group of people left Africa, traveled through the Middle East with only a few, very limited uh, number of genetic uh, variants. And they broke up into small people groups and they dispersed across the whole world and they traveled through the Middle East. I mean, this is the Tower of Babel story, but they have the origin in Africa because they can't have it in the Middle East. Even though the bulk of the genetic diversity in Africa is in Northeast Africa, not Southern Africa, not Western Africa. It's in Northeast Africa, right next to the Middle East. You can't actually put your finger on the map and know where anyone started. You can't do that. You can look at a family tree, you can look at the genetics, and you can see who's got more diversity, but you don't know where people started because people move around in history. They live there now, fine, but it doesn't mean they were living where you think they were living 4,000 years ago. In fact, um, this, this model can easily be replaced with an out of Babel model, and you get very similar results. Have you ever struggled with the thought, though, that um, there were other people in the world other than just Adam and Eve? I mean, when Cain killed Abel, he was worried that whoever finds me shall kill me, he says. Doesn't that mean there's other people in the world? And then Cain gets married right after that, and he's got kids. Where'd Cain get his wife, right? This question people have asked for a long time. Well, I answered that in an article. How old was Cain when he killed Abel? Oh, because the next time statement in the Bible is, Adam was 130 years old when, he, when Eve gave birth to Seth, and Seth is named replacement. He's the first male born after Cain killed Abel. 130 years? Cain and Abel could have been great, great, great grandparents by this point in time. There could have been thousands of people in the world. Or Cain being smart, understood biology and uh, exponential reproduction and said, wow, there's going to be a lot of people really quick. Either way, there's a 130-year window for this murder to occur. There's plenty of time for other people. We don't need people outside the garden. Uh, Joshua Swamidas is a, um, grew up in a young earth creationist household, very, very dedicated Christian household. But he's a, just calls himself an evolutionist today. And he wrote a book called The Genealogical Adam and Eve. And I had to review this on, for creation.com. And he, his model is evolution happened. And then a long time ago, God picked two people and evolved Adam and Eve. And they were genetically indistinguishable from all the other people. And their children intermarried with all the other people, but eventually everyone in the world became a descendant of Adam and Eve, at least up to the time of Christ. So when Christ died for all people, that applies to all the people in the world. Whoa, 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 whoa. What about the people in Abraham's time? And because we're broken up into isolated populations, it's not necessarily true that everyone on earth, even by the time of Christ, would be a descendant of Adam and Eve. What about the people on Nicobar Islands in, in the Indian Ocean? Uh, some of those people are completely isolated still today. From modern, What about people in, in the Amazon rainforest? To become a, a descendant of Adam and Eve, someone has to get across to North America and then their descendants have to spread throughout the Americas. I mean, this is really problematic. Uh, it's also completely unnecessary. All right, but I don't, I'm not here just to slam somebody. I'm just saying there's a lot of people giving alternate theories on human history. And we're trying to contradict them because we want a biblical model of human history. All right, you okay so far? I'm going to do this. I got 10 minutes. And I got a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to talk fast. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> So I go to the Thousand Genomes Project, and I download the Y chromosome data. And I take that Y chromosome data, and I throw it into an evolutionary tree building program, and I draw this graph. And I am amazed, because I see human history here. I see so much interesting things. I see my Y chromosome group, R1B, branching off from R1A. Those people are found in Pakistan and India today. Those are different branches of the Indo-European language family that started in Central Asia. Q, Native Americans. I'm more closely related to a Native American than I am to maybe someone from China or Japan, most of whom are group O. And Genghis Khan, 
The Mongolian warlord belonged to Group C. And we have the Khoisan Bushmen, the African pygmies out here on the edge. And then most of African men belong to E1B1A, which is, you know, the numbers are irrelevant. I'm just, just, po- just describing these people on the chart. This is fascinating. But my Y chromosome, my ancestor came from Ireland. He fled Ireland in the Irish potato famine in 1845. So R1B, it's an Irish Y chromosome. The other Irishmen belong to groups like I and J. Now I want to explain, you see how these things look like broomsticks with the bristles? Let me explain what that looks like. I call this a broomstick model. When I'm pulling genetic data and drawing these trees, each of these little bristles on the end is one person. And the length of that stick is the number of letters that person has that nobody else has. I have mutations in me that no one else in the world has. In fact, all of us do. We inherit about 100 brand new mutations that happen because the reproductive cells our parents give to us, and then as we're developing in our mother, our cells are dividing, mistakes happen. All of you have unique mutations. So you would be your own little stick. But a lot of times, a whole bunch of people, maybe like a million people, they can be traced back to a single individual. One lucky person that lived 10,000 years ago, or maybe one out of only the 100 people that were around at the Tower of Babel. Oh, interesting. But then these people come together to a line of ancestors that don't have any branches, which is strange, and we eventually have the group ancestor. So when I'm looking at this picture, I'm thinking, okay, where's Noah? Well, Noah's near the middle somewhere. This explosion, that's what you expect to see in an exponentially growing population, which is why the population of East Asia is this beautiful fan, because when they started farming rice thousands of years ago on the banks of the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers, their population started to grow, and it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And yet, my Y chromosome group is kind of spindly. In fact, my Y chromosome didn't come from Europe. When we're digging up old graves, we find these people in Central Asia. These are the Scythian peoples. These are the warlords that buried themselves with their horse and a sword and maybe a wagon and under the grass north of the Caspian Sea. That's where the bulk of the European genome comes from. We're not actually Europeans, strangely. But if I'm looking at this, I'm trying to say, okay, where does the Bible say the sons of Ham went? Well, that would circle these individuals. Where does the Bible say... um, Sorry, I forgot all about all this stuff. The sons of uh, Shem went. Well, a lot of Jewish people belong to group J, and we know the Jewish people descended from Shem. So maybe that's Shem, and that would leave this as Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth might be there. I'm not saying they are there, but they might be there. This is a map or a family tree of the mitochondria in the world. So all of you carry a little piece of DNA you only got from your mother. It says we have African lineages out here. We have Europeans here, Asians are over here. But notice that some of these people that go back to a common ancestor, some of the branches are twice as long as others. Twice as many mutations in the same amount of time. There is no molecular clock. Therefore, you can't say mitochondria leave or Y chromosome Adam lived so many hundreds of thousands of years ago. Because mutations happen at different rates at different times. Oh. Okay, one more thing. Let's get into the, I'm going to wrap up with the races question. Have you ever heard that there are three races? Anyone my age or older has heard the words Negroid, Mongoloid, and Caucasoid. I don't like saying those words. They're incredibly racist, but that is what I grew up with. All the old textbooks had this, uh, this idea in there. And biblically, it seemed to be supported. So Christianity kind of accepted these evolutionary words because there are three sons of Noah, and it seemed like Ham went to Africa, Shem went to Asia, and Japheth went to Europe, right? Shouldn't we expect three races? No. Because what do you do about the people in Central Asia? They don't look European, and they don't look Chinese. They're in between. So yeah, if you take people in Iceland, Southern Africa, and Japan, they look very different, but the people in the middle look like a combination of them because there's not a place in the world you can draw a line and separate people into races. It doesn't exist. Sadly, there are still Christians today who believe that 
Black people have dark skin because of the curse on Ham in the Bible. Worse, there are some people, and I've run into them online, it sickens me, who believe that black people were slaves because the Bible says they're supposed to be slaves. This is not true. That's bad theology. This comes, though, from Genesis chapter 9. Noah, after the flood, made some wine, and he got drunk, and he fell asleep, and Ham walked in and laughed at him. But when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord of God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Doesn't that mean that Ham, the Hamites should be Africans, should be slaves? No. Because Noah said, Cursed be Canaan. And we know where Canaan is. We call it Israel today. That's not in Africa. The Canaanites weren't Africans. In fact, if you look at where the Bible says the different groups went, you have Hamites in Africa, in Asia, in Arabia, and in Turkey. You have Japhethites in Turkey and eastward. You have Semites in Asia and in Turkey. And it's interesting that the Turkish farmers, this amalgamation of people descend from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were the first large wave of people that moved up into Europe. Later on, people from Central Asia also swept in. So 30% of the European genome uh, came from Turkey. And Turkish peoples, even back then, are amalgamation of all three of the major lines. Um, yeah, there is not three races. Worse. This is a map of where my Y chromosomes found in the world. There's me from Ireland. Uh, but who are those people in Central Africa? In Cameroon? Those men with the darkest skin on the planet who share my Y chromosome? And remember, my Y chromosome group is recent. I'm more closely related to people with the darkest skin on the planet than I am to perhaps my great-great-great-grandfather's Irish next-door neighbor who came from group I or J. What is a race? I'm um, afraid I cannot any longer define that word. But evolutionary theory has a, a dark past about this, this subject. This is a quote from Charles Darwin in The Descent of Man. He wrote this in 1871, 12 years after the origin of species. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Whoa. He means the Europeans are going to kill off all the brown and black people. At the same time, the anthropological apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest ally will then be wider. It will intervene between man and a more civilized state, he meant European, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now, between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Does that turn your stomach? It should. It is evil. It is wrong. But this is the father of evolutionary theory, simply applying evolutionary theory to humanity. Happily, uh, this has now changed. Luis Quintana Mercy, a famous geneticist, wrote this. The genes that explain, um, phenotypic means the way you look. The genes that explain the phenotypic differences between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. So biblically, I can't define what a race is. Scientifically, I can't define what a race is. There's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of anger. And you know what? I don't fault African Americans for being very bitter about how they've been treated from one end of this country to another. The history is really sad. But scripturally, Colossians chapter 3, there's neither Greek nor Jew, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, there's neither barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. In Christ, there are no racial divisions. Consider Isaiah 59, 20, a redeemer. That was the same word in the book of Ruth. Naomi had sold her land and spent the money. She wanted her land back. She had no money. So a kinsman redeemer, Boaz, stepped in and paid her debt for her. Now he got Ruth in the deal. That's a good bargain, right? 
And Ruth becomes an ancestor of, of King David, therefore the ancestor of Jesus. But a redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Um, I'm not Jewish. Boaz cannot pay my debt. He's Jewish. Who's my redeemer? Because this is definitely applied to all people in the New Testament. Well, the redeemer is Jesus Christ, and the reason he can redeem me is because he is my kinsman through Adam. And if Adam didn't exist, I'm in deep trouble. For so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. With the result that now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's talking about Jews and Gentiles. I'm not Jewish, but I can be in this number? How is this possible? When I read the history of my people, I'm disgusted. They were wicked. They were brutal. They were evil. They did things to each other that is it's simply not polite to talk about from a pulpit anywhere. They knew nothing of the God of the Bible. They didn't know Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. They didn't know Jesus. In fact, the first place the gospel went to out of, Jerusalem, out of the Israel area proper was Africa. Philip went and spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he was going back to Africa. You know how long it took to get to, to Lithuania? It was 1200 AD before it was finally Christianized, and that was brutal also. I don't deserve to be in Christ. But thank God, Christ and I are both descendants of Adam. Acts 17, he hath made both of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of all the earth and hath determined the times before a point and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. My friends, we are all equal in the eyes of God. We are all equally sinful. We are all equally in need of a savior. We're all equally loved. And being that, we all have this, essentially the same number of generations from Noah. We're all essentially exactly the same. And if we can swap organs, we are the same. The things that separate us is a trivial couple of letters that mainly affects our skin color. Trivial. And we major on those things. There's a lot more information that's in creation.com. I would encourage you to go take a look at that. But if you're going to ask me a question, I'm probably going to point you to Scripture first. Read your Bibles. That's going to answer more questions than anything else. But creation.com is there second. After that, uh, I'm going to recommend Creation Magazine. The guys are going to hand out a sign-up form for Creation Magazine as we're wrapping up here, just if you're interested, and come out to the tables there. But if you do sign up for the magazine for a two-year subscription, I'm going to include several special gifts for you. One is the digital version of our magazine, which we want you to share with other people. You get our monthly mailings too, but I'm trying to get to this. We're going to include Darwin, the Voyage that Shook the World. In honor of Charles Darwin's 200th birthday in the year 2009, we went around the world following his footsteps, and we made a National Geographic-style documentary on his life. Uh, if you want to understand evolution, you've got to understand Darwin. He's not the person most people think. That's there for you. But also, I'm going to include something called Fallout. We took a TV camera to five or six college campuses in the Atlanta area, and we interviewed students on the street. And we only asked them three questions. We said, did you grow up going to church? If they said no, we said goodbye. Oh, you did grow up going to church? Were you ever taught anything about creation and evolution? The third question was, do you still go to church? That was it. And man, those three questions opened up a very fascinating set of conversations, which were captured on DVD on Fallout. And you can get that with a two-year subscription. All right, guys, you can do that now. And I promise I'm going to supposed to stop five minutes ago. But who can stop? This is too much fun. Uh, that's what the sign-up form looks like. After that, uh, if you need a recommendation, I'm going to recommend that red book, the Creation Answers book. That's going to answer 99% of your questions. We wrote that to do that specifically on purpose. We also have the Starter Pack, which comes with uh, two excellent books and a DVD. I've got several presentations on genetics, one mitochondrial leave and the three daughters of Noah. Uh, I gave this in Australia several years ago. Or the High Tech Cell. 
this is my favorite presentation I've ever given in my life. I'm comparing the genome to a computer, and very, very, very quickly we realize that no computer matches the complexity of the genome. That was fun. Here's evolution's Achilles heels, um, just a bunch of nerdy scientists talking about what evolution cannot explain, powerful information. Most of the stuff we do, we on purpose write it like an eighth grade level, like a typical newspaper. This is a higher level. This is high school, college level material on purpose to be as hard hitting as we can be. But I'm gonna leave you with this, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And that doesn't mean trembling, it means respect. We are to answer people respectfully, because you know what? We've got God and the Bible on our side. We can answer people's questions confidently and competently, but the competence only comes through a lot of study. I'm encouraging you to dig in. We have answers to your questions. You okay with that? Now let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this evening that you've given to us. Thank you for this crazy thing called science. We are challenged. It's hard. We don't understand. And our adversaries are trying to use it against us. Please help us, Lord, to have our questions answered, our fears taken care of. Please help us to study, to, spend, to convict us that we need to spend more time in your word and figuring out your world so we can be better and more effective witnesses. As we find our questions being answered, help us to open our mouths and freely spread these answers to the people around us because many of them are desperately wanting someone to tell them the truth. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Carter. We appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that he's spending his life helping the body of Christ get answers. And uh, we don't have to sell out to the world's theology. We have it. Just go back to the scriptures, follow the scriptures. And that's what is amazing. It seems like to me, the, the further down you get, the more clear it gets. You can count on the scripture. And so, um, what I love about this church is that we take the opportunities to have people like Dr. Carter in so that you're informed, so that I'm informed, uh, so that my kids are informed. I appreciate this place so much uh, because the investment that they make in my kids and the investment they made in me when I was a kid to teach me truth and to answer questions. I love the fact that I grew up in a ministry with Dr. Scudder. He was never afraid of a question. He would, he would welcome questions. Please ask me anything. And I love that. And so we, we have the answers. We can go back to the scriptures. And what, what, a, what a powerful thing. And to think about our series that we're going through, Is the Old Testament Obsolete? Pastor Scudder doing that series right now, going through some of the same things, walking through Genesis, and seeing how important Genesis is. Because where Adam failed, the first Adam, the second Adam didn't. And that's why we have salvation today, because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And what a tremendous thing to know that I can go to any people in the world and say, God loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. That verse right there, for God so loved the world. God so loved the world. There is not a corner of this globe that God did not die for. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Are you thankful tonight that God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you? I hope you are. I hope you are. And I hope that drives us to serve the Lord even more, to find the answers, to search. See, so many people today, they're just going through life instead of really digging in and finding answers uh, that we can find. And so what a tremendous thing. If you're here tonight and you've not trusted Christ as your personal savior, God loved you so much that he'd sent his son Jesus to die for you. And simple belief, simple trust in what he did for you gives us eternal life. It's an amazing thing. And if you're watching tonight, simply put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ right here, right now. 
And uh, what, a, what an awesome privilege it is to be able to serve the Lord and uh, be able to share that message throughout the world. Let's pray as we close, and then we'll uh, close in song this evening. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had tonight to learn, and we thank you for uh, the ministries um, of Creation um, International, Lord, and we just ask that you would uh, be with Dr. Carter, and we appreciate him and his ministry and his dedication uh, to giving uh, answers and, and tackling these questions. What a, a tremendous uh, presentation he gave tonight. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we think about our eternal life. If there's anyone in this room or anyone watching tonight, Lord, and they've not put their faith and their trust in you, that they would do that tonight by realizing that God loved them so much that he sent his son to pay their sin debt, and by simple faith they can have everlasting life. Father, help us to get that message around this world as much as we possibly can. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you all stand as we close with our final song, Glorify Thy Name. family camp this week.